This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. This show is brought to you by Slice on Broadway. Supporting Pittsburgh podcasting with the perfect pepperoni pizza, sliceonbroadway.com. And listeners like you, support this show at patreon.com slash awesomecast. Sidekick Media Services. We are your sidekick in business for social media, video production, and more. Find out more at sidekickmediaservices.com. Hey guys, it is the Awesome Cast. It's time to get geeky, get awesome. We are live here from the Sorgatron Media Studios in Beachview of Pittsburgh, PA, and we got a heck of a show. We're back in, well, okay, we're back on the night. I know we kind of uh, shuffled the times around. We kind of had an opportunity to go hang out at a uh, charity wrestling show last Tuesday out in University of uh, Pittsburgh, Greensburg. Uh, thank you so much to the Pit Fight crew uh, out there. Those kids are, are put on a really awesome show. So, I, And I think I think wrestling promotion is going to become a major out there. It's a, it's a club right now and, and there's some cool stuff there. Check out the last couple episodes of Wrestling Mayhem Show if you want to find out what's going on with that. But we are back with us. First of all, uh, in studio with us is... The Gadget Guru of Big Bank International Esquire. It is Chilla. How's it going? It's just, good to be just, back. And I feel bad. I, I have poking to Poking away at your surface over there. I, I have to apologize. I didn't see the Slack message where it was like, can you record on Monday? And I could have recorded last Monday. Everybody could have, but nobody was reading Slack last week. No. That's okay. Dave Potter of the Tiny Shutter Podcast, uh, Prof Pod on the Tweets, who I visited two times this week at his work. <laughs> for uh some other business uh he he filled in and he's always a good uh he's always a good guy to be on the show and he, we get entertained by his cats and his dog uh <laughs> joining us on camera a lot so uh you know thanks for him for uh filling in there and i see he's already hanging out in the chat room uh as well so uh, yeah i've been i've been cubicle stalking him uh, at his workplace lately. So I we got. Oh, go ahead. I saw you in the farm of cubicles. There was a picture. There was. was. Oh yeah, yeah. I was discovered just like mm-hmm. peeking over the the cubicles. Uh, it, you know, surprisingly, I should really warn him when I'm coming in there. So, anyways, uh, we have some special guests with us. We heard us mention um, over the weeks that uh, we are a member of uh, Post Industrial Audio, and uh, we have the folks from Post Industrial joining us. Here on the show, one Matt Stroud. How you doing? He's the executive editor over at Post, Post Industrial. How you doing? Good. How are you? Excellent. And also, Alex. Hi. Alex Egan is with us. She's Hello. the head of sales and marketing <laughs> over there as well. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Do you know what you got yourself into? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Katie's not here. No Pornhub stories. Uh, <laughs> so they have great technology. Some good, some good charts. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but anyways, uh, this is the Awesome Cast. Please check out everything at awesomecast.com. Uh, and uh, please email us at awesomecast at sorgatronmedia.com. Tweet us awesomecast. Check out the Facebook uh, page and group. A lot of great discussion happening throughout the week, including stories that we'll be talking about uh, coming up on the show. And uh, good to uh, have that conversation started earlier before we get to Tuesday nights here. And uh, you can also ask your Google Home and your Amazon Echo uh, to play the Awesome Cast podcast. You may have to connect a tune-in account or something. I, I asked my, my uh, <clears throat> Echo to play music the other day, and, and it brought up Pandora instead of Amazon Music, which hmm. kind of surprised me. Maybe it just didn't have the track or something. It was kind of... That would be super cool if I, it knew that it didn't have the track and sent you to the service. That might did. be. That might be. So, But I think they only have a handful. Like, it's probably like Pandora and Spotify, right? But anyways... My Google Mini does the same thing. I, have a, Google, <clears throat> I have a Google Music account. Mm-hmm. Goes directly to, to yeah Spotify uh, yeah that's what I I typically we have two Google Google uh, Home Minis in here and that's what we typically are using for day to day music so and the, and the uh, A Train is there uh, you know to let me know when my package is at home <laughs> so <laughs> when my when my package is uh, ten stops away. Um, but anyways, we are on there. We are connected on that, and even the uh, the uh, Siri Home Pod as well. You can check us out uh, when we don't have scheduling conflicts every Tuesday at Awesomecast uh, Facebook Live, seven p.m. Eastern. We're also on other formats as well, including the Periscope. 
and our YouTube and over on the Sorgatron Media Twitch account. Uh, but of course, if you are joining us on any of those other formats, please pop into the Facebook Live. That is where we do have the chat up. And uh, typically, producer Missy will let me know if I'm missing anything important out there. But we keep an eye out for you guys, just like Alex Carr is out there in L.A. Dave Potter have all already been talking about. And, hey, John Carmen, he, we got to get him back on here. Um, actually, I think I might have scheduled him and forgot. Uh, <laughs> so he should be coming back very, very soon. Uh, but anyways, uh, if you are listening to us on one of those other formats or later and want to be part of the conversation, tell us what we got wrong. Uh, hit us up, AwesomeCast, on Twitter with hashtag AC466. And also, thank you to our audio partners, the aforementioned Post Industrial Audio at postindustrial.com and our streaming partner, the405media.com. That last thing I knew are carrying us every day at noon Eastern time so you can catch up on the latest episode of the awesome cast thank you patreon supporters at patreon.com slash awesome cast our friends at the coffee club five dollar dollar uh matt weller who i'm in a dead heat with on uh mario kart tour uh <laughs> or and, and dr mario world i think he's still uh whooping me there also john diggy de gore john carmen and our longest running patreon supporter at the family show one dollar level uh michael fedor thank you so much everybody supporting the show patreon.com slash awesome cast if you'd like to as well so let's get into our awesome things of the week. Um, I kind of mentioned Mario Kart, and we I th- we talked about it. I think when it first launched, didn't we? Like it would just come out, maybe. We talked about it or during it the a, beta. We talked about, about it when to. it launched. We talked um, about it. I can't stop playing it, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to keep talking about it. So I'm going to keep talking about it. Um, I keep catching up on things. I mean, it's my unawesome thing is I keep running out of tracks to play Chilla. I've ran into that problem too. So I started. It's been out for two weeks because I, I think it's been since we've been on. It's been full. I started on. a week ago Saturday, so I, I just I just started introducing my kids to the original Mario Kart. My kids are very small. The original, right? The original, yeah. like mode seven graphics, yep. oh, flat. That's, that's a hard Amazing. one to play. It yeah. is hard, especially for little kids, right? But they they enjoy the hell out of it. Can you guys talk me through what the difference is between? that the 16-bit version and what you're playing which i imagine is just yes they want you to buy rubies okay yeah, that's the it's, first thing so it's the game's free uh-huh. it's on your phone it's on your phone yes it's oh on your God. phone there's no gas pedal you're pretty much only steering you can play with one left. hand just yeah like you can Mario play with run. one hand mm-hmm. uh-huh. that's what so, you said. so it's meant for commuters like if you're on a bus or on a train or whatever you can play <laughs> or have one hand at night one hand it sets the speed. You just control left to right, and you oh. can set in the settings like, do you want, like, where you? I don't even know how drifting works. So you can either drag your thumb left to right, and that's the way your cart goes. Or mm-hmm. there's this other newfangled way that they do it. Mm-hmm. That my I, kid, my I five year old, thinks like I'm like old. I didn't even I bother drive. with the new bits. So <laughs> yeah, here here's a there here's is. a little the visual for you guys uh, up on the monitor here. The, the big difference is, like, you kind of have to collect, as with the other fr- freemium things, you have to collect your characters, and certain ones have um, better stats on certain tracks. Like, uh, Baby Baby Daisy here is doing better on this track, and this is a... And all the tracks are, are from other games. You'll see, like, Super Nintendo tracks in here that have been modified and upgraded, of oh, course. Okay. This, like, this was uh, an N64 Calamari Desert. And uh, you know, you pick your guy through, and boom, boom, boom. It th- fills it out. And these are other players, but they're all all bots. Hmm. But I think they kind of base who you're up against, like kind of on stats. And can you and play other like humans? That. Um, That's not coming. yet. Not yet. There, there's a slot for, and it says coming soon. So uh-huh. from beyond that, and I'm I'm playing this on an iPad sideways, by the way. <laughs> and I'm probably going to do quasi okay, like. Pulling it down so you can get your little uh, jump start here, and, and everything a little thing kind of gets you points. Like a jump, a jump like that will uh, sort of uh, you know give you a little bit of a boost, and as you're going through here, and you get weapons, and you know, but with a little bit of a tinge of like all oh, those more recent Mario Kart games too. And I just got uh, squitted a little bit. Uh, <laughs> this is which sounds really weird, probably for you guys on audio right now. So I mean, that's basically it. And you play through, and you collect stars to open up new um i don't know what this is i don't know every every level is two laps yeah every level, every level is two laps was so good because i think in the beta like some of them were like three or four and they just felt like you were going forever it's a nintendo product still right yes yep. they're not like in bankruptcy or anything like that no 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 no, so no 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 are they also putting out games that are not designed to be nostalgic um no not really, really? well, well they, you know so they, overwatch, they have a couple they the have overwatch the, came to switch 
which is but as far as Nintendo, nostalgic. you're you're talking about Nintendo Mobile or Nintendo Nintendo like the Switch or something. I mean, if I'm if I'm asking if Nintendo is in bankruptcy or not, I am they're, obviously not. They are doing they're very, very well. They're doing fine. Right. So yeah. <clears throat> it is mobile, whatever the hell else. Yeah. It's, well, it, there's a Nintendo Switch, which is kind of your you plug it into a TV and mm-hmm. and and. Uh, uh, you, can you can unplug it, it and it's you. mobile like an old you know DS or Game Boy, and it's playing like full on like Legend of Zelda. You know, Overwatch just uh, it just came on it, which is a big console game. Can you play the eight bit versions? Uh, yes. So if you so if you pay four ninety nine a month, I think something it is. like that. It's like twenty dollars. So, so like their version of online. So like Xbox Online huh. is sixty bucks a year. Yeah. Theirs it works out to be I think like forty bucks a year. Um. Do you guys find yourselves wanting to play the more nostalgic games or gravitating toward games that are Both. new? It depends on where you're at. I got a whole room that's just nostalgic games at home. Like it is like I have probably 10 consoles in there. But the, and it's but like, the, hey, let's play some Nintendo. Let's play some awesome. let's play some PlayStation. Yeah, it's that's basically it. The Xbox one is here and it gets very it gets played whenever we have people here to do gaming events. But the online gets you online gameplay and then it gets you their back catalog. So, like, I have the original Super Mario Brothers, Super Mario 3. I don't know if there's an old version of Mario Kart. There might be. Like, Kid Icarus, the original Metroid, the sure. original Zelda. And they just, so they kind of did, like, a back catalog of probably, like, 100 Nintendo games. And then they've just started to re-release. Into that back catalog, they've started to release Super Nintendo games. So, Super Mario World, F-Zero all those types of games. So for five bucks a month to have like a cat, you have a catalog of a hundred or so games. Yeah. That's not bad. Plus you're getting to play online and whatever else you want to play. That's new. Uh, I, I think it's worth it. Personally. I'm dating myself, uh, myself in a lot of ways, but like what I, what I equate that to, I can remember that there were emulators for a while mm-hmm. yep. that you had to like, yeah. they're essentially hacking these old games and making them available to you. You can like use the pirate bay or whatever to get access. Mm-hmm. to all Yeah. Yeah. It's games. still available. Still a lot of those out there. Well, but so it seems like Nintendo and maybe PlayStation and other, other gaming systems realized <laughs> that they had this gold mine in this, mm-hmm. in this catalog of games. And rather than like allowing people to just use these emulators and have to take care of finding that catalog themselves, that they would do it themselves. So this yeah. is like the transition from Napster to like pay, pay <laughs> and music. And they've been doing it since uh, probably when did the Wii come out? 2004? Does that sound right? 2004, probably 2006? Uh, because they opened a virtual store with that and they did start like they, they would spoon feed you. Hey guys, Mario 3 is out and this, this console's <laughs> it's been 99 out for cents. Years. Right. No, no, it's five bucks. Oh. You know, because everything was like incredibly expensive hey here's an s64 game for ten dollars yeah right you know something from like you know 1998 you know and here is a a, a nintendo game for five dollars it just it just felt like i think it was even more than that i think about it like like (laughs) super nintendo games might have been ten dollars sometimes and it's just in the playing it's just like this is in a turbo graphic 16 and everything so it was always like closely held to the chest Right until they put out like the the Nintendo Mini, and then that's still a hundred dollars in a collector's item, and the Super Nintendo Mini, and now this is the first time where they're just like, here, have everything. You well, know? to your point about emulators, that's exactly what they're doing. They're mm-hmm. using emulators, and then you're getting all the ROMs loaded onto the device, and you're good to go. And PlayStation, <clears throat> when they did the PlayStation Mini, someone figured out that they could upload. Yeah. any rom to that yeah. and then play it it's so. a nice little console it's it's it, it, it apparently easily accessible <laughs> and and in the uh uh late uh 1995 to or maybe it was 94 to 1999 selection of games on there don't hold up all that great <laughs> But you can really load anything you but want. You, you so. like, but then I can load any PlayStation game I want, I guess, on there. So well, I don't know. Maybe we'll have to investigate that at some point when I, when I have a minute. But uh, but I'm playing like Super Puzzle Fighter and uh, uh, IQ iCube, uh, which is a fun, weird puzzle game. Like uh, they have the original Resident Evil. I don't know if I want to put myself through that again. Not just because it's a little scary. Actually, it's probably a lot less scary now. And but it's like you know you had like move your guy and then move forward kind of thing. You know, it was really kind of awkward. You static backgrounds, um, pixelated zombies and birds that attack you, you know, yeah, really, really bad live action intro. <laughs> like really bad. <laughs> so. Think about when you, when you watch 
old films, like films that were created in like 1900. Like those yeah, films, yeah. they're not films. Same it's, thing, it's, same thing as uh, mid 90s FMV full motion video CD ROM anything video games hmm. because it, you gotta think they're like trying to be Hollywood motion video entertainment and yeah that one game got Mark Hamill for Wing Commander but it was like real low 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 budget for what they were doing I mean the, the progress is, is phenomenal right the, yeah. there was there was a project that I, I can't remember the name of the woman who started this project this is at CMU and it was called the Olive Archive I think is the name of it and the idea was that she wanted to archive every one of the video games that had ever been produced like mm -hmm. from you know pong or whatever preceded that to where we are right now and like house them all in this one place because what we're talking about is like all, all of the control of those old games those libraries are, are in the in the hands of corporations that still own those old patents copyrights whatever mm -hmm. um and so having a place where you'd have a library and be able to gain access to like the first version of Metroid and or the first version of Pong that was ever produced, like regardless of what system you've created. I mean, that's a really fascinating idea. And I wonder why. Well, I guess I know why it hasn't taken, <laughs> yeah, yeah. taken hold. Because Nintendo's still doing OK. Because <laughs> they're still doing all right. Because <laughs> well, yeah, they're, they're still using why, that. Right? So there, there is a, I'm going to blow up the format a little bit here, but uh, there is already, um, like there's abandonware games and then there's people like Library Congress Internet Archive. We actually have something in the, in the rundown here where um, the Internet Archive already has, you, if you go there and go to a certain section, there are video games being emulated in browser that you can play from multiple consoles. I think you can even get on there and play probably Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, and I don't know how they're like on getting the around web? Like on can, the web mm -hmm, in can... a browser. And they just uh, released 2,500 MS-DOS games. Like We're talking about like Zork, Alone in the Dark, Alien Rampage. <laughs> you know, there's games in here. Was I, I want to see what this game is. I have no mouth and I must scream. <laughs> like, what is this? And, you know, this is, this is high-level... Uh, games uh and, and again like the first, the first thing like things like infogrames and and things like that and, and which i've always said wrong it actually is infogrames with an r uh <laughs> like are companies that are not around anymore interplay you know uh games like you know uh, companies like that so this is a thrilling alone in the dark um mm -hmm. clip by the way did you, did you ever play like any text adventures as a kid yeah like it would be like the go north yeah and it was like single static picture right they a lot of those are on there so like if you want to relive your childhood <laughs> like you can grab like the old text adventure type games well i mean um, talking about progress over the years like if you think about the first version of the legend of zelda like a lot of what was going on like yes you're you're maneuvering around you know the castle mm -hmm. to to find what you're going to find but a lot of it is just like that card and information that's being dis displayed, instructions on what you're searching for and what to do next. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's evolution, and it gets to the you know where we are now, which is a lot different. But like, it's yeah. fascinating to think of the changes that have happened over time and where we've gone. And even I think they have like you can load like old software <laughs> they have on there too, like mm -hmm. old old Windows software and DOS software too. Uh -huh. So they're like you know load up uh, Amiga computer or something or other. You know, it's uh, it, it's pretty cool what they're doing over there. And again, it's kind of the you know this is art this is history this is um um kind of a digital literature right yeah so i mean to to be able to preserve something like that it is i mean really obviously fits in the library of congress mission so when did they start doing that with the uh, library of congress several years ago yeah, it's at this while. point <clears throat> so uh, this is just kind of the latest dump here uh for them to do so we were we were in the basement, I think, when they created that. Oh, we were definitely in the basement uh, a few years ago doing this show. Uh, so uh, archive.org, um, go look for the video game archive, and you can dig into all those. So now that I've had an expanded uh, awesome thing, uh, <laughs> uh, let's go with uh, hey Chilla, what's your awesome thing of the week? So Google had a bunch of announcements today, in amongst their new phones, new laptop, Chromebook. Is this an announcement? Palooza new, here. New earbuds. Um, they also announced an update to their Wi-Fi product, which is now being rebranded into the Nest space. So it's Nest Wi-Fi. Um, the cool thing I thought that you would like is not only um, does it allow you to expand your Wi-Fi reach across your house. I think three devices will get you 3,600 square feet, I think was the number I heard, mm -hmm. um, at 
about 1200 megabits per second. Every one of the little pods is also a Google mini. So no, as and I think that what they want you is they want you putting these like on your corner tables or wherever spread amongst your house. And then you can say, okay, G man, um, whatever. And it'll actually take care of any of your Google assistant needs around your house. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, the base, and it's also backwards compatible. So if you have the older main hub and you just want to expand it with a couple of the expansion um, devices, they come in three colors, snow, sand, or mist. Um, I'll let you decide what colors those are in real life. We're just inventing colors at this point, aren't we? Yeah, you can, but you can buy just like the expansion pieces mm -hmm. and expand your existing kit. Um, they are not Wi-Fi 6 capable. They're, they're claiming that they feel like that's not really going to be a thing until 2022, and I'm sure they have multiple more announcements that they can wait to expand to that new the new capability. I'm sorry, it's 3,800 square feet, which my house is not that big. Um, but I thought it was a, a pretty cool concept where they can add that to every endpoint. A two-piece setup is $269 for the router, and one Wi-Fi point, and a Wi-Fi router with two points is three hundred and forty-nine bucks. Wow! So, where do you think that technology is going? I guess when will they just put it into like the power grid? And <laughs> well, right. So, like, w uh, we have we have these things in our pockets, right? You would think that eventually you'd get to the point where you wouldn't need to purchase different pods for the different parts of your house. There would just be, you would just have the ability, your phone would be connected to your lights and the television that's in the specific room that you've moved to, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't need those, right? Yeah, so I mean, basically, we're kind of backwards jerry-rigging this, right? right? To bring the home technology up to talk to the phone, right? So, you know, if it's if everything we buy in the next 10 years already has a Google I must say a Google person in, inside of it, <laughs> but, but I mean, you know what I mean? Like, you know, somebody to talk to. Well, isn't, that it, listens. isn't it, isn't it kind of what they were trying to do with Google glass? Like where you would just be wandering around with mm -hmm. this thing on your head all the time. And the, since Google glass looked so silly, it didn't really get adopted. But and, really, well, that, but it also relied on the phone oh, paired to it. Yeah, it, it was wasn't like its phone. own self no living i think they were if, talking about eventually that happening but we never got that far so it, it, it could have happened though right like yeah. that could have been your google home on your head mm -hmm. right just like my watch has cellular connectivity i don't need the phone near my watch right i can get a text message make a phone call whatever what the interesting thing that you bring up though is like can't your phone just be that end point yeah why can't it be my google and Mini? to me until cellular carriers are truly unlimited mm -hmm. at a at a acceptable price rate for all with coverage regardless of location because i mean there's still what we call it the nebraska effect there's still <laughs> people with dial-up dsl right yeah over a phone line type internet connectivity you think the mm -hmm. cellular connectivity is the issue i think it's the it's the promise. App, or I think it's AT and T, Verizon, and everyone want to keep keep getting a dime off. Yeah, it, right? yeah, right. But but if you open that up and it became as persistent and as affordable as your home internet, then it just yeah. opens up the technology. I mean, as it is, my car has a device that has LTE in it. Verizon, uh, when they came to town talking to bloggers, they're talking about their technical unit where they were um, um, pushing for companies helping to incubate companies that used LTE technology. Because then it's more stuff to connect to their service than we have to pay for, right? Um, you know, that makes us dependent on LTE and, and you know, keeps you on Verizon internet, say. Um, so, no, that's that's definitely the point. I mean, there's, I mean, there's like, I subsidized home internet for yeah. different people. And what, it's, it, but anybody can kind of get internet at an extremely $20 a month kind of cost yeah. but that doesn't help my but, sister who's like just outside can't get cable where she's at um only gets dsl and can barely even watch netflix she got too tired because direct tv kept screwing her over since at&t bought them hmm. and um also at&t user myself but yeah uh and there was no other option like i started looking at like like cell plans and i'm like hey there's a and there are caps on them 
generally they're caps on them or they're prohibitively expensive. And you then you know. pay for overage. Yeah, you pay for overage and everything like that. And if you're like, I want to sit in my in, to sit in my home and watch Netflix, I'm not going to worry about overages, right? Right. So, yeah. So mm. it, it's it, it's getting there, but man, I, I we get unlimited plans and and we have too many devices on AT and T, and we don't have internet at home. We I just hook my iPad into my TV and just watch. Wow. And that's it. I'm also barely home. I'm always here, but uh, so that's not as much as it could be. But you know. Let's plug it in and watch some BoJack Horseman. You, uh, I don't want to betray your privacy or anything like that, but it, it is do you live in a rural area? Like I live three blocks away here in the city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. So I have, so you know, I have LTE. You know, not full bar because I'm on the wrong side of the hill, but still, huh. you know, I I watch everything through there. So, but we also have like two iPads, two phones, and two Apple Watches. So, huh. like, we have multiple. You know. Uh, it's it's like it's like you drug if you if you imagine like an internet line for each device you have in your house for LTE it starts to get a little like what am I doing right sure because that's like you could drag like six phone lines in my home for the equivalent of internet connection do, do you see yourself getting these these super minis or whatever they're called I would love to if I had home Wi-Fi or an alternative right. that it wasn't cost prohibitive through AT and T do you think you'll get these when I'm ready to, so I have one, two, three, four. I have five access points strategically placed around my house. Are they all Google devices? No, they're actually oh, qualification. They're all Chilla, Chilla is basically the home of the future, and he's <laughs> troubleshooting all this stuff for us today, <laughs> so, so, so that we don't have to five years from now. So I have mine are all actually Apple, and they're technically probably end of life. Hmm. So. When it gets to the point where I can't get data across my house fast enough, I would probably go to a mesh-based device. This would make sense from the um, assistant being built in there because so along with all of my access points all over the house, we have Google Minis. What's their five-inch screen? Are the homes? No. We have... The home is that what it is? I think they're. So I have one of their five-inch screens. I have two of their speakers, and then we have Alexas everywhere. Hmm. Oh, okay. how many Alexas do you have? Six. Dude. So you have eleven of these these devices, kind of strategically up. placed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Alex, and I have room. I have room for like one or two more. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, so out of curiosity, why do you need so many? I mean, I, I have one Alexa, and I don't use it very often. What do you I, use it for? I, honestly, like, I – the bare minimum. I use it for music, um, like, the weather, like, you know, random stuff. I do not utilize it nearly as much as I should. I don't use it for anything complicated. But why really. do you need so many? So we play a lot of music. We use it – the big thing with our son is we – everything is time boxed. So you're going to go upstairs to bed in five minutes. Ah. Okay, Alexa, set a timer for five minutes. <laughs> wow. To the point where like now it, it works in reverse. We thought we were brilliant because we never had a one of those bad moments where he was like, I don't want to do this because right. it took it actually took the human element out of the equation. It was like Pavlov's <laughs> dogs, is, the bell rang, the kid right. went to bed. Or, this is not your parents' decision. <laughs> or whatever. It's Google. But now it's like when... He's like, will you play a game with me? Yeah, I'll play a game with you in 10 minutes. He's now, okay, Alexa, set a timer for 10 minutes. So now I'm on a 10-minute timer to finish whatever I was doing huh. to go play with him, which is cool. I'm, I'm totally cool with it. But we use it. So he also, fortunately or unfortunately, if he ever goes to other people's houses, he doesn't know how to turn on their TV. Because <laughs> in our house, you say, Alexa, turn on the TV. Right. Or Alexa, turn on Nickelodeon. Yeah. Oh, you did! Oh, there she goes. There she so, goes. <laughs> so, when you're in our basement, you can say, "A train." That's why we use the code right, words right. too. A train. It's movie time. Mm -hmm. The lights dim to fifty percent. We have a backlight around the TV that kicks on. The Apple TV automatically comes on. Like it does a bunch of like I've stranded together a bunch of right. stuff too. You literally live in a smart house. That is so, so but but then if I'm upstairs. 
and he gets up in the morning, I can say, turn on the, turn on the living room light and the lights turn on. Or I can say it's bedtime. Everything powers down in the house except for the lighting to get to our bedrooms. And then you get upstairs. Is it weird when you go to like on vacation or, or the relative's house or something and you have to like I, I know for me like it's you have weird to kick it old school. It's weird to go to a place that has television, like like cable television. <laughs> you know, we went on vacation and ended up watching HGTV because there was television. Right, that's all and we watch the, anyway, and we you have know, cable but we TV. don't have that. We we don't have like I haven't had I haven't I haven't had cable TV for ten years. I don't um, think, but you know, but you go somewhere it's like all oh, right, I gotta wake up and hit the light switch. <laughs> like, I don't think it's. <laughs> you just know, like in your space, there's a mindset, right? Yeah, and your kid's not like talking to, so to the wall guess, trying to turn a light so on we somewhere. Haven't, we haven't, we haven't made it where like in the old days you would always have like a bedside light that you could reach from bed. Mm-hmm. Mm. Like that's no longer we're no longer restricted to having a lamp next to the bed because sure. I can control my lights no matter where they are in the room or sure. if they're in the ceiling or whatever. In those like in visiting family, visiting hotels, whatever, there's always that bedside lamp. There's mm-hmm. always a plug right there. Like we've taken that out of the equation. So it's not as important. Mm-hmm. Like how close you are in proximity to things. Because you don't have to touch it. Because I don't have to touch it. But in other people's houses, they they don't have that. But they the amenity is still, the, the concept or the amenity is still there. Mm-hmm. So I'm really not losing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Either way, interesting. I'm more interested in how fast their internet is at their house and how good <laughs> it's so saturated my, into so their my, backyard. All my, all my devices still work while I'm visiting. So we, and we don't we don't live in a large house by any means, but like I couldn't even with like a Wi-Fi spot like in the middle of the house, I couldn't get it all the way to the backyard, which is why we put like one of these types older, but one of those mm-hmm. types of devices in the back room in the basement. So. If you're at the end of the backyard, you can still have internet. And mm. Then it extends to my garage because my garage isn't connected to the house. So w- what's your background? So I work in technology. <laughs> okay. But I work in the financial industry for a bank. Big bank. They don't let me touch. They don't let me touch the money. <laughs> <laughs> but the technology allows everybody to access the money, so it's yeah. extremely important, right? Right. And I actually my background is in messaging, which became mobility, which became these types of devices. Mm-hmm. Messaging? Yeah. What do you mean? Like email. Email, instant messaging. Um, like if you look which at... Like forums are, and... Like, I, like ICQ back in the day? Like yeah, ICQ like, back sure, in the sure. day. Like how, how that actually could transform the ability for a worker to do so much, to be so much more productive. So 10, 15 years ago... I sat on the phone all day in meetings, doing whatever, but the majority of my work was meeting based and trying to multitask to get maybe like the next piece of code written or whatever I was working on, but it was heavily based on the phone. Mm -hmm. So they started giving everyone two phone lines, right? Mm -hmm. So now I could toggle between this meeting and that meeting, but how good was that? And if someone needed a yes, no answer and they were in a different city and I was here, you know, you're picking up voicemail. Well, imagine if you can start messaging people in the office. And it was like we had our own little AOL instant messenger, but it was only because in the banking industry, you don't want people yeah. from the outside getting in and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So we, we had that kind of thing. So I ran a portion of that. I ran our email. And then how do I get my email securely on this device? But if you leave the company, I can pull it back, but not destroy the pictures of your kids and your dead <laughs> animals and whatnot. So, uh, did you were you on AOL and Instant Messenger like before you were doing this work? Yes. And, like, did you kind of realize that that was the direction that your business? So I would say the con- the, it's called the consumerization of IT. Yeah. Um, yes. Like we borrow a lot from you know where the consumers are going. What what kids are doing today, um, what trends we see in the industry, what things make us nervous, what things don't. Um, I was, I was reading recently about the origins of Slack, right? That, that program, like it started as a gaming system. 
kind of like Discord did, and now it's it's kind of <coughs> getting integrated, right? So yeah, like, and there was this yeah. messaging platform that was a part of the gaming system, so that people could talk back and forth while yeah. they were playing games. Yeah. And like a big investor came in and said, like, this gaming stuff is fine, but uh, why don't you turn that into like a consumer product? Yeah. Like that that messaging system because it could be really. And cool. now a lot of us, a lot of us use it, and now a lot of us have found alternatives to it because it's gotten so big. Like we're using uh, Riot over at WorkHard now. Why? Why? Uh, I think it was the cost and maybe the it, uh, privacy. Like I think there's been some privacy concerns with Slack lately. Mm-hmm. Uh, plus, you know, just they can run it on their own instance on their own server now, because you know they can. So, mm. and it's been an interesting. It's interesting. It has its own app and everything. So it's integrated. Look at really like well. Twitter was that stuff super did, close tw- tw- Yeah, Twitter was what three guys in college that wanted to stay in touch after they graduated, and they yeah. built it. It was built for. SMS texting. Yeah. 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 So, kind of group yeah. SMS testing, texting and it grew into what it is now. Like I remember oh, I remember just I just remember tweeting on a on a flip phone back in the day. What's what's interesting is the kids and the generations today and the ability to spin up a stream, mm-hmm. a video stream mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the ability to mm-hmm. mass broadcast <laughs> I think is going to transform the the slack is the cool trend and it's now how do I do massive video streams mm-hmm. but make it interactive and back and forth because mm-hmm. is that not part to of be the... rude but the financial industry isn't like cutting edge all the time and we're <laughs> pretty we're pretty conscious about cost risk and security sure. so how do you take the concept of youtube and and live broadcasting and bring it into four walls and not let it out but let everyone kind of collaborate and communicate. Mm-hmm. It's a it's an interesting problem to solve. And that's why we when have you have to overlay those additional requirements. Plus, if you're, um, I don't want to bore you with banks but <laughs> speak, but like Fin Finra regulated. If you're a Finra regulated employee, I have to capture and maintain so many years of all of your electronic communications by law. Mm-hmm. So now think of the storage that I have to put out to keep this thing in our four walls. Like it becomes a very interesting paradigm. What platforms are moving in that direction? Like is TikTok like starting to I don't think TikTok's not long like long no, enough. No. I I'm interested like Facebook is doing the whole Facebook at work and and Google has like their Google business side. I'm interested and Microsoft has started Streams, which is like a corporate YouTube that actually will do terrible name, but facial yeah. rec- <laughs> facial recognition. So I can say, Hey, show me every video. It doesn't know who's who, but it knows like the face because <laughs> it can't put a name to the face. But I can say, Hey, this per- person in this picture, show me every video that's in the archive with this person in it and give me the time markers that they're speaking. Um, the transcription for the, for, um, from an accessibility or disability perspective, the voice trans translation and auto closed captioning is big. Um, and now like Microsoft has added accessibility checkers. So if you're typing an email and you're flipping font sizes or you're doing something, it'll actually check to make sure that people that, um, may be visually impaired it's easy easy to read for them Hmm. it'll check if you have a bunch of tables and someone's blind and they're using a screen reader will this actually read correctly to a person that can't see Hmm. um there's a lot of different stuff in that that technology realm that's pretty cool i was thinking about video a lot recently with regard to there's a guy who i met i think he's at cmu who's trying to start a new company that is like you know what toastmasters is yeah, like, it's like to, the public speaking thing, it's like the public speaking class, and like you have to be in 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 person to do yeah. the class. Like they have meetings, and like you give presentations, and like it's supposed to teach you how to be a better public speaker. And he wants to put this online, and one of the one of the components of this that he wanted to implement was using facial recognition on the people who are watching the video itself, so that you can get automatic feedback about how the presentation is affecting the people who are actually sitting there watching. So like they, if they say something and you know, it makes the people in the audience cry, like you want to be able to identify that this is an outcome that came from this particular speech. Um, it seems like that'd be really cool. And what's interesting too, is will 
that way of communicating shift the presentation paradigm because I know people that are very good public speakers. They can get up on the big stage um, and nail their presentation. They can connect well with their audience. They're a phenomenal presenters. I know other people that can't get up on that stage, but are sometimes more brilliant than the guy that got up on stage, sure. but they can give an amazing presentation as long as they're their That audience isn't out there. Yeah. And maybe they have like crib notes and bullet notes over here that that person that got up on stage was a little better at memorizing. And this person needs some notes, but they know they can go real deep on a topic. So when it comes to Q and a, it's a whole different shift. Hmm. Um, so I think that kind of thing will also, when you get into the electronic, not everyone has to be in person. I think it'll shift the dynamic of what makes a good presenter. Yeah, that's Absolutely. a really like good point. Knowledge, knowledge on the topic and being able to go deep will, I think, become more important than being able to get up on stage and really get your your audience engaged. Yeah, what we're talking about, what you're talking about there is the idea that the audience doesn't necessarily need to be there in front of your mm -hmm. face and that as technology progresses, you are going to have audiences that gather for these specific moments, like this one. Yeah, um, yeah. And that, you know, being able to stand on a stage is not going to be as important. Mm -hmm. And what some people weren't good at being on the stage, that opens them up sure. to a whole new There's world. some people, again, from a microphone like this in front of, like, 50 people, 100 people in a chat room. But that you can put them in front of 50, three people and they're going to clam up. It's, it's, sure. it's fascinating, right? Because you don't think about like you know, there's that, that's always been a thing like when when you know we're doing this in a in a basement somewhere you know it's just like oh nobody's listening but I'm talking you know even though I see the names in the chat room it's just like not present you know but you're still kind of on the stage doing that yeah so totally. so much easier to talk to a camera than <laughs> than to people. but you so many yeah. but I've seen the other side too we uh, um uh, several years ago when I was doing interviews for the Pittsburgh Foundation. This guy was getting in front of like rallies, and he was uh, he was pushing for like some really big, um, um, uh, 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 criminal you know criminal crime you know legislation uh, uh, for uh, you know forgiveness and stuff, and um, and he, and we got him in front of a camera, and he just could not get out, couldn't get uh, off first base. Hmm. It was crazy. So, but anyways, uh, speaking hey. Speaking of being on here, we got to give a shout out to our sponsors here, our good friends at Slice on Broadway. And I, I want to catch up with what you guys are doing at Post Industrial. Uh, check out our good friends at Right Up the Street supporting here. We're, we're trying to think about it. It's, it's got to be like six or eight years. The guys have been supporting us with pizza <laughs> so we could uh, feed our guys. They had one location. Uh, supporting Pittsburgh Podcasting with the perfect pepperoni pizza here in Beachview, Carnegie, PA, East End, and over at PNC Park, home of the Pittsburgh Pirates. I know not much going on over there right now, but they are still open for you to pick up some pizza uh, right across from downtown there. I believe uh, Uber Eats or something, last I knew, will deliver it from uh, PNC Park. Mm -hmm. so they had somebody in Bellevue picking it up from there. So go check out our friends for supporting the podcast for so, so long. So, um, Alex, Matt, you guys with Post Industrial, uh, you guys are, we got your first edition in the mail of the, of the print. You have a print edition. I do. <laughs> uh, podcasts, uh, the site and everything. You know, first tell us, what is Post Industrial for those that haven't checked you out yet? Uh, Post Industrial Media is a company that curates and produces conversations from the heroes and villains of Post Industrial America. Um, what that means is we do a lot of podcasts and we do a bi-monthly print magazine that encapsulates some really interesting stories about the region and people who are doing interesting things here. That's our, that's our big thing. And so the reason why we're working with, uh, great podcasters like Mike Sorg, uh, is that our belief is that a lot of where podcasting is going in the future is, is local. Like there are huge podcasts that are produced for international audiences. I happen to be working on one right now. Um, but that there is a very strong audience of people who listen to podcasts like yours, mm. um, where, you know, they need advertising and they need marketing, uh, that are built around advertising to a local market and stay in touch with, uh, local businesses. And, uh, that's where a big part of our business is going right now. 
and that's been a big that's been a big struggle i know for for shows like us because we are you know we we kind of started as the flyover state um answer to like the cnut podcast we were listening to you know <laughs> that was ba- that's yeah. basically why we started and um and and it's always been like well you know we're not big enough for a Squarespace ad spot but how do we talk to locals and, and get that and it's kind of nice having a partner like knows how to have that conversation here with you guys you have those audiences here they're mm-hmm. they're they're listening to your podcast they're listening to podcasts like the drinking partners podcast and and pitchworks uh and all the other great podcasts that are over at epicast and everything that you produce um and there's an arc there's a market there there's an audience and so we want to we want to try to nurture that audience and let people know that it's out there and you say producing some of your own stuff uh i i've been listening uh here and there to pittsburgh record uh, which I believe is a daily news. It is a daily podcast. news podcast. Yeah. Daily localized news podcast. How about that? Yes. The so. Pittsburgh Record. And that also has a daily newsletter that goes out That's every true. day at noon. Yeah, we have a newsletter that goes out every day at noon. Uh, the Pittsburgh Record, done by a guy named Adam Schuck, who's been doing this for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it goes out to about 12,000 people. Um, has an incredibly high open rate. Um, Sometimes he gets as many as like forty percent of those people who wow. open up every single day. That that's uh, I mean, what is typical for emails is like I thought like eighteen 10, or something. 10, yeah, ten like these something days. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah. so he's he's got a very loyal audience. And then he also started this podcast that just every day continues to grow. Um it is amazing to watch somebody like that work because Every day he's producing probably between 1,500 and 1,800 words just in curation Jeez. for that newsletter. And then he will write the equivalent of a newspaper column every single day where he talks about something significant that's, that's going on in the news um, and breaks it down into a you know six to eight minute podcast uh, where you know pretty much everything that's going on surrounding a particular issue. So like today, um, he was talking about kind of the latest with regard to the district attorney's race in mm-hmm. Allegheny County and Lisa Middleman and Stephen Zappala and where they are in their, in their political battle. Um, and I knew very little about the politics of that situation until I listened to Adam's podcast today. And it's, he's incredible at being able to distill those issues. Uh, this is of course, you know, and, and I'm involved in another project that, that, that has a big newsletter play, um, it seems like people are, I don't know, revisiting email for one thing, mm-hmm. you know, and then it's coupling it with podcasts, um, as, as you know, it, you guys kind of have this, oh, I just heard a term today from another, um, um, journalist on a podcast, but it's kind of like an all media approach or something like that. Mm-hmm. Is that, is that, is that the right term out there? Um, I mean, Alex, you're, you're in the sales, the sales and marketing side of this. How is this kind of, uh, a, a special situation with post industrial and how many, avenues they're hitting here uh well what do you mean when you say all media just that we're well this is like podcasting web print oh yeah yeah Yeah. exactly i mean that's yeah all media (laughs) exactly (laughs) how you said it um i mean it's it's great because there are i i I have a a media sales background i used to sell tv Mm -hmm. um and you know it's it's different because this it, it almost feels like it's going backwards because it's print and podcast which podcast is you know so similar to radio but this is really where everything is going and you know same with newsletters it seems like newsletters are from a thing of the past but you know I was telling Matt like you know I read I read four newsletters every morning before I even get out of bed just Mm -hmm. because that's what I want to get my day started that's your newspaper yeah exactly it is my newspaper I don't have time to sit there and read through like a whole thing I want it quick I want it fast and I want to know everything before I go out and start my day. And I think a lot of other people do too. And same thing with podcasts. I mean, podcasts have, you know, obviously have grown immensely on a national level over the past couple of years. And um, like Matt said, there's kind of a need for it on a local level. And, um, you know, it's, it's really growing. I think that's the way that a lot of media is heading. That's the way a lot of people consume their news. And um, that's that's where the audience is. So I think in terms of, of a sales perspective, you know, it, it's it's growing very very quickly and i think you know that's that's the route that a lot of advertisers are starting to want to be on mm-hmm. which is great for us so excellent hey so you, you guys are, are are been into this um um geez I, I think you've been working at this for about a year hasn't it been since we first talked i really feel like it's been longer than that no it hasn't <laughs> been that, quite that long i think when, I, when we first came in here to talk 
It was like, <laughs> it's almost been a year. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like November, December last year, I think. Um, uh, uh, growing into this, because th- is this your first launch of a product like this? Mine? Personally? Yeah. yeah. Uh, more or less. Mm-hmm. I ran a magazine when I was in college that was like a <laughs> precursor to this. Okay. And we, I mean, we put out, uh, it was, it was a going concern for, you know, two years, two and a half years, something mm-hmm, like that. Mm-hmm. Um, printing every other month, uh, much sillier than the stuff that we do right now and, and much more built around like satire and weirdness. Um, but same basic business model. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's amazing how similar uh, the sales process is and the editorial production process is. Mm-hmm. Um, and really, when you're moving over into podcasts, you're just you're redirecting the conversations that you're having and distilling into print and or on the web, and you're putting them into conversations like this one and then selling those. Excellent. So a lot of it is very similar. Excellent. Excellent. Do you do you feel like the marketing and advertising aspect can be more calculated in the newer mediums than if I ran an all media like I put an ad in a newspaper, a magazine, on a billboard, whatever, all simultaneously, and then someone bought my product? Unless I went and asked them as they bought it, like where did you hear about us? There's no way to track what actually had the biggest market penetration. Whereas now I can send a unique link to everyone's email that I know that this person clicked on this link. That's true. Or I know this person used this discount code out of off this podcast or this link from this podcast. Like the ability to track and create analytics and metrics behind that, I think, changes the advertising game. But I don't know oh, if you, yeah. you see that or not. Definitely. I have people ask me that all the time. How can we track this? Mm-hmm. And um, it's definitely, you know, it's helpful. I mean, it's it's different to look at it because, you know, things like podcasts and newsletters are not going to reach the masses. Like, it's not going to reach hundreds of thousands of people like, you know, a TV ad would or something like that. But it's also, like, a much more specific audience. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, you know, the people you're reaching with this kind of stuff are the people who are way more likely to buy your product anyway. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's kind of just, like, cutting out the middleman and, um, you know, it's, like, a more cost-effective way to get exactly who you're looking for. And then – like you said, I mean, you know, you can, there's a, there's a trail there. Like there's a, you can track exactly who's listening, who's clicking, who's following the links, who's actually buying. Um, you know, I think that's super helpful. A lot of people are, are kind of looking to be little detectives in that way and figure out where everything's coming from. Well, and so much of it is built around personalities too. Like, mm-hmm. and, and the, the mind of the person who's curating, you were talking about the newsletters that you read in the morning, Alex, right? Mm-hmm. I do a lot of the same thing. Like there are specific newsletters that I listen to and they're catered to like specific ideas that I have about like what the news should look like and the kinds of top, like, you know, I wrote a book about uh, policing. And so like I get a lot of, I have to get a lot of information about policing just to catch up on a lot of that stuff. Um, And so it's directed specifically at me and, you know, the Pittsburgh based CNET is Mm -hmm. kind of another thing. Like Mm -hmm. there are people who are in Pittsburgh who are interested in the kind of technology that you're interested in. And if you are an advertiser looking to get to those people, it's a smart play. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just having somebody that knows how to have that conversation. (laughs) We know how to have this conversation. (laughs) And that's her sitting right over there. (laughs) (laughs) So if if you guys have listened on the show, you know, over over the last several months, you may notice, you know, we have had some different ads on the beginning of the show. And and that's part of that, you know. I mean, we were, you know, putting stuff out for like, you know, the Cultural Arts Center uh, uh, Cambodian rock band, you know, which is like we never would have had that conversation with somebody like that. So that's been a really good uh, partnership that we've had. And it's really cool to see. Um, you know, I, you know, we're sharing post-industrial stories, um, in, in our groups here and there too, um, when they cross over into our, uh, per- technology purview, especially here in Pittsburgh, we love seeing those local stories. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's a, it's a cool thing, you know, and again, you guys are also doing longer features too, right? Sure. Like these, this isn't like short clickbait stuff like this is like, you guys are doing, um, a, a bit of investigative with this too. Sure. Not so much on the podcast yet. Not on the podcast, but I'm talking about like, you know, um, post-industrial as a whole. Yeah. I, I mean, my background is as an investigative journalist. I, mm-hmm. you know, spent the better part of a decade doing stories that, you know, would take sometimes six, eight months longer. I think for when one story. I think when we, we first talked, you were working with The Verge on the Republican National Convention, actually, right? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, I was covering the Republican National Convention in 
Orlando. That was one of the worst weekends of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. They had it in August in 2012, and oh, it was like monsoon season and 100 degrees oh, and muggy. Geez. And like, I know I w- it's really mild when I go in March for my work. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we were assigned, we were assigned to to cover the protest outside. Okay, like, so we weren't inside the RNC. So like, we're like living in tents with all of the people who are protesting this event. Um, and like, uh, it was just for everybody there, for people who were protesting, who were covering it, it was just like horrible. But yes, that's when <laughs> we first started talking. Um, but yeah, my, my, uh, I've been writing long magazine articles and mm-hmm. long web articles for, uh, for years. Like I mentioned, I, I wrote a book that was published this year. Um, it is part of my background in the way that I think about journalism, that it shouldn't just be very quick. Um, you should have some some thought put behind it. So a lot of the journalism that we produce in post industrial is is built like that. It's built to tell a whole story rather than just what's happening right now. And like I said, there's a lot of crossover. Hell, I'm I'm just uh, popping over there and I'm seeing about the artificial intelligence in a box over hey. here. Uh, I'm going to have to dig into a little later. That's a cool story. <laughs> it looks like a really cool story. Uh, so all right. So uh, where again? Where can people find uh, what's going on post industrial with you guys? Postindustrial.com. There are no spaces or dashes. P o s t i n d u s t r i a l dot com. Excellent. And uh, subscribe to the podcast, the newsletter, everything. Everything's there. <laughs> with more to come. Can you talk to us about what's coming? Uh, or, sure. Is it? Yeah. About. Um. Well, I mean, so we have a couple of new podcasts that are uh, set to launch in. January of 2020. Um, we just recorded a demo last week for uh, these two new podcasts that we're really excited about. Um, one is uh, focused on the Girl Power Pittsburgh uh, group, which is a you know a, a female empowerment networking um, group of of women. Um, I, I I know personally one of the the founders of the group and she and I went to college together and um, she has a huge following of women all over the city. So um, we're going to do a podcast with her focusing on, she's going to interview um, a bunch of different female entrepreneurs in the area, female business leaders. Really excited about that one. And yep. then um, we are also working with one of the food influencers um, in the city. Uh, her name is Hungry Girl Big City. And she, ha- she has like 35,000 Instagram followers. Um, her Instagram is amazing. If you are feeling hungry, don't look at it because right. <laughs> you will immediately need to go wherever she's posting from. Um, but she's going to do the same thing, kind of um, talk to some of the female chefs and uh, restaurant owners in the city and then also do a little bit of exploration on you know pittsburgh's culinary secrets and that one those are both going to be a lot of fun and i know we're really excited about those and um, <laughs> we have a bunch more in our back pocket that's awesome mm-hmm. i love this uh so go check them out again a great partner with us and and uh and and thank you for helping uh expose us to more people with your newsletters and the site and everything too i really appreciate that it's too. a pleasure you, you do great stuff thank you uh so uh we didn't get too much into stories this week that's okay there's a lot of conversation you guys are having out there um over on the awesome cast pot uh i'm sorry group on facebook we've had a lot of discussion about catalina i haven't jumped into catalina yet chilla i'm all in you're all in the Catalina. I threw it on the old, almost blew up laptop though. Is it running? <laughs> it's yeah, it's running, but also it had go? nothing like old on it. I don't have like I don't CS six Adobe stuff on it. I don't have that many old. Like my my Adobe version, while it's not Creative Cloud, I, is... I, I'm already moving myself off of Video Monkey. I've been using Video Monkey for years for compressing all my long wrestling videos. But uh, other than that, you don't use Handbrake. Well, no, I actually uh, I've been using compressor more. Okay. So, and actually, well, I found, and that you'll be good to go on you that. Know, it's just old habits. I knew it was a nice thing, and I, you know, I started using compressor settings, and they work just as good. <laughs> They're probably a lot more reliable than what I was using. Um, so um, I'm holding on that for a little bit. After I heard how some people got kind of, we use too much Adobe, I think, in here for me to touch. But you're that on for, Creative Cloud, so you're always going to be current. Yeah. So yeah. you're good to go. But I. It's the people running in the Chilla, pirated Chilla. 32-bit version Chilla. from like seven I'm years ago. I'm still authoring DVDs. So, but what do you use? Oh, well, I've been I've been trying to move it on to Final Cut, but um, but either way, and plus I had a live stream off of that laptop too, so I'm not touching it. I'm not touching it until <clears throat> I'm sure that all my live stream components are going to work. But um, but other than that, you know, the great conversation about that. 
Um, I know Amanda and some of the other people were, were talking about um, um, their fears, and, and I think I think Amanda had a really smooth conversion as well. So, um, and other than that, let me double check if there's any stories I really wanted to touch on before we get out of here. Oh, shout out to, we were talking about classic games, Matt, and uh, our buddy Chachi, he's been going through 1,001 games to play before you die. Hmm. And, uh, Is that a book or just a it's website? A, it's a book. It's a book he found. He's been obsessed with this for like the last five years or so. So over at the gamejourney.com, he's hitting he's hitting a lot of weird like these are he's he's, he's advanced Dungeons and Dragons Eye of the Beholder <laughs> game for like nineteen ninety one on DOS and then ninety four for <laughs> SNES and Sega C D. I think he's in the SNES version. He's been doing a lot of that. Some Dungeon Master stuff, some uh some classic NBA jam on the Super Nintendo uh desert strike like he's he's digging in there pretty good and speaking of emulators he bought a nice pack we talked about this on the show before it's a nice pack of usb controllers and it's like an nes one a super nintendo one an n64 one so like it will feel like it's supposed to feel when you plug those games in because there's no way you're going to find these games otherwise right like who's who's picking up advanced Dungeons and dragons eye of the boy beholder it's probably on the internet archive in that DOS like drop they just did, right? right. I mean, that's that's that is Dungeons and Dragons, but just a lot of obscure Dungeons and Dragons games over the years. <laughs> so um, go so check out the game journey.com, our good buddy over there. Uh, some good reads there, and he's been he's been really digging into that. Um, other than that, man, we talked about a lot of uh, Mario Kart. Uh, if you want to jump into the group, uh, we uh, have a lot of stories over there. Again about Catalina and all the all the pe- all the issues people have been having. Um, whatever Google killed later, Uber pets. The fact that you can um, guarantee your Uber will allow your pet with a fee. Really, it's one way to do it. Hmm. It's one way to do it, and uh, a lot more. Um, guys, uh, thank you so much. It's great to be back in studio here, John Chachilla. John Chachilla on the Facebooks. Now I'm failing to. Do my sign off. Chillatech.net, <laughs> uh, Chilla photo on the Instagram, and Chill on the Twitter. There you go, Matt Stroud. Where can they find you? My Twitter? Yes. At Matt Stroud. That's easy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had to fight for that. Alex, you got any social medias you want to share? Um, I haven't used Twitter in quite a while, to be <laughs> honest, but I'm on Instagram at I am Alex Egan. There you go. Go check out there. Check out our friends over there. And uh, thank you, everybody, in the chat room. I see Alex. Alex is out there um, uh, trying to make sure that his Photoshop's going to work in the new Catalina. Again, if you're updated, you should be okay, I think, maybe. Um, and uh, Potter says he's still a chicken, and he's, uh, he's afraid he's going to kill his machine. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, aren't we all? Especially if you do like production stuff, that starts again a little, little iffy for you. You can do a time machine backup. You can do a time machine backup. <laughs> Oof. Anyways, thank you so much, guys, for joining us uh, again. Please go check out everything going on at awesomecast.com and sorgatronmedia.com. We just uh, dropped uh, new episodes with our friends at Comic Book Pit. Uh, they were live from the New Dimension Comics um, grand reopening uh, since they moved from the Century Three location. Um, they finally. Uh, Finally got everything quasi organized in their new space over in Homestead at the waterfront. So please go check it. It's an awesome. It's like it's probably the biggest comic book store, like just comic book store I've ever been in. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Like an entire storefront um, that used to be like I don't know a, 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 a Marshalls or something, right? It's really? it's it's nice just to go in and just see just a giant space with everything geek. Uh, so please go check them out. Of course, Thrifty. Uh, speaking of Dungeon Dragons, our friends at Bardic Mystery Ter- Tales just put their episode out y- yesterday. And of course, uh, our friends at Old Pittsburgh Sports, uh, who are approaching their hundredth episode. To talk to them, see if they're doing anything special for that. So go check all that out. SorgatronMedia.com. Uh, thank you to our awesome audience. Have an awesome week. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.